Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the anchor points that we can anchor ourselves to uh, in these turbulent times, in the times that we live in, in the seasons that we're in. And Father, we pray for your revelation and we ask Holy Spirit that you would just uh, open up the word this morning to us so that we might believe, so that we might actually change and we might be growing and maturing. And we thank you for it in your precious name. Amen. 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 As you're aware, if you're visiting with us, uh, we're on a series called Anchor Points. And the point of the series is to give us some things to anchor to in, in seasons that uh, we have to navigate. And I felt very much, and I, I probably shouldn't focus on it because I've probably said it too much already, the Lord wants us to mature. He wants his people to grow up. He's saying to us in this season and this decade, it's time to grow up and stand up and be the people I've called you to be. So this morning, I want to talk about his promises, some amazing promises that we have in the Bible. There are hundreds of promises in the Bible. I'm going to read just a couple right now. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, For the Lord is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. That's a promise to us that his faithfulness continues always. Every generation, it just continues. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and 33 say this. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and these things will be given to you as well. It's a promise. If we seek first, these things will be added. If we are being the people we're supposed to be, these things will be added. If we're in his house, which we are this morning, these things will be added to us. It's a promise from the word of God. Mark 11, chapter, sorry, Mark 11 verse 24 says, Therefore I tell you, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Now, that's a freaky promise. Has anybody found that one operating perfectly in your world? But it's a promise. It's God's word and it's true. And it, 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 the, the thing comes back to us about the belief that we have. Believe that you have received. And that's really hard when you haven't, because it's in the future. But you have to have that belief, you have to have that faith in God, and it will be yours. Now, I could go into a whole, I mean, we could use that one verse of scripture and preach a whole sermon on it, because it's not about blab it and grab it. It's not about, I want a Rolls Royce and you're going to get it, because you're not. Okay? It's not about, I want a Porsche, you're going to get it, because you might. Or you might not. <laughs> if you're visiting with us, we've got an ongoing, in, you know, an ongoing fun thing with one of our members who would like to buy a Porsche. <laughs> one day. One day. But, but the scripture is not there for, for us to get. It's actually there for us to be praying for people. It's actually there for us to be believing for things that, that are righteous and within the kingdom. It's not about stuff. Does that make sense? And I don't have time to, to focus on that this morning. But, you know, there, there, are, there is teaching and there has been teaching within, within Christendom about, you know, you name it and claim it, all this sort of stuff. It's very poor teaching. It's not, it's, not, it's not kingdom. It's not what God wants for us. But he is telling us that if you believe things, you will receive them. It's a promise. John 3.16, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. One of the best promises in the Bible. That whoever believes in Jesus will have eternal life. That's why we can have a hope of heaven, because of our belief in Jesus Christ. God's promises are rock solid and can serve as an anchor point for our faith. There are many old covenant promises and many new covenant promises. And they should all excite us. As we live for Jesus, they're, they're not things we should forget about. We should remember the promises of God. I mean, that's why in some respects in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, they were even told to write them down and stick them on their heads. They, they had this little box called phylact phylacteries or something like that. And they, they were to tie them around their head when they went to prayer. And they were supposed to you know, remember the things that were written down, remember the promises of God. Because it's the promises of God that are true. And when we're going through some things, you've got a promise to stand on. You've got a promise to believe. This morning, I want to 
focus on the new covenant promises or some new covenant promises because there's a heap. But Hebrews chapter 8 verses 6 in the NIV says this. And it's talking, the context here is it's talking about the ministry that Jesus has as opposed to Abraham and Moses. It says, but in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one since the new covenant is established on better promises. What this is saying is that Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant. We have old covenant and new covenant. That's why we have Old Testament, New Testament. Another word for that is covenant, the promise that God has made to his people. We have the old covenant, which has been completely fulfilled by Jesus. There's nothing in the old covenant that remains unfulfilled. It's fulfilled. It doesn't mean that it's done away with. It's fulfilled. Now there is a new covenant and it's a better covenant because it has better promises and a better mediator. You know, let's face it. Jesus is a way better mediator than Moses, as good as Moses was. He's a way better mediator than Abraham, as good as Abraham was. Anybody that has come in that that lineage that had promises from God, Noah had covenant promises from God. But Jesus is a way better mediator because he's the son of God. He created these covenants. He understands these covenants. And he has given us better promises. Let's just have a quick look at those. He's the, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. It's superior than the old one because it's based on the better promises. So what are those promises? Here's a couple of them. Number one, God's laws became inner principles of our hearts and our minds. God's laws became inner principles of our hearts and our minds. His laws are no longer written down on stone tablets. It says, it says in the Word of God, and we'll get there a little bit later, that they are being written down on our hearts. His promises are written on our hearts. When we've asked Christ into our life, when we've made that decision to bring Jesus into our life and the Holy Spirit comes upon us, His laws and His principles are written in our hearts and our minds. We, we need to read this because it tells us what the, the promises are. It tells us what the covenant is, but He's also put them on the inside of us because he's indwelt us by his spirit. The second thing is, God and his people will have intimate fellowship together again. The new covenant brought in fellowship again with God. Instead of having to stand in the outer courts and do all the sacrifices and the things that had to be done under the old covenant, we actually, each one of us, corporately and individually, have a relationship with God. There's not one person like the priest who would go into the presence of God once a year. And the priest would go into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies, with a rope tied around his ankle, with bells on it. So if the bells stopped moving or he stopped moving, they assumed he was dead because he'd gone into the presence in an unholy manner. So as long as the people could hear the bells while the priest was in the Holy of Holies making the sacrifice and putting the blood on the altar, things were good. If the, if the noise stopped, they thought priest is dead, we better pull him out. That's why he had a rope on his, on his ankle. Because you, you could go into the Holy of Holies in an unholy situation. If you hadn't done all the ceremonial washings, if you hadn't done all the, the seven-day purification, all the things that you had to do to go in, and only one priest could go in once a year. So this is a way better covenant. We can all go anytime. before God anytime. 24-7, you can go into the presence of God. 24-7, you can be in the Lord's presence. He's wanting you to come into his presence. And that's why Jesus went to the cross so that he could fulfill the old covenant and you and I could have fellowship again with the Father. Unhindered, uninterrupted. And you know, the funny thing is, we probably don't do it enough. Here we have 24-7 access to the, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and Maybe, if you're anybody like me, you don't do it enough. Except when you go, oh, Lord. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I, I try and, and calibrate my heart every morning just to be in his presence. You know, I just, I, I try to have moments during the day where I just calibrate my heart. I, I don't know if calibrate makes sense, but I just reset my, my affection. Um, you know, and I don't do it necessarily every day, <laughs> but, but I try. Before I go to bed, I recalibrate my heart and I thank him for the day that he's given me and for, and for my wife and those sort of things, just to just acknowledge his presence. 
because we have a great, great covenant that we can come 24-7 into his presence. And it's not like his presence isn't around. It is, but it's acknowledging it, that he's with us and for us. The third thing, sinful ignorance of God will be removed forever. The sinful ignorance of God will be removed forever. And I'll get to that in some of the scriptures, but that's what has happened for the whole world. We were ignorant before, now we're not. We actually know about what Jesus has done for us and that ignorance has been removed. The, the fourth thing, forgiveness of sin is an everlasting reality. Forgiveness of sin, our forgiveness is an everlasting reality. There's nothing we can do to stop the fact that we are forgiven. There's, the, the whole world has been forgiven. Jesus took the sin of the world onto the cross and gave his life for it. And now you and I can live in a forgiven state. We just need to keep coming to him and ask him for forgiveness. But it's a permanent thing that's never going to finish. In Second Peter, we find a powerful encouragement connected to God's promises. Let's look at that. Second Peter verses 1, I think I'm getting through 1 to 3 to start with. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those through the righteousness of God our Saviour Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Just watch that word knowledge. It comes up quite a lot of times. Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. I mean, verse 3 is stunning. It's just an incredible verse. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. I mean, again, there's a scripture that we could really meditate on we could really think about we could really you know rather than just reading this on one sunday in 2022 it would be a good idea to take this scripture this verse and meditate on it and read it constantly through this year to to get revelation on the fact that we've been given everything we need so often i think m myself included we're not sure that we've got everything we need we feel like when we, we, we come across a certain circumstance that we need something else, some new revelation, another prophecy to help me get through. No, no. You ne we need to understand what God has already given us, Amen. that he's given us everything we need. We need to tap into the everything we need. We need to tap into him. It's got to do with our knowledge of him. If we know him and if we know his promises then we can actually navigate a whole lot of things in life without needing another prophetic word or needing somebody to pray for us. Now, those things aren't bad. Prophetic words are great. Getting prayer is great. But what the Lord is saying to, to his people is, hey, I want you to know me and know that my divine power has given you everything you need. And it's, it's, it's being in that relationship and learning what that really means. All of us need to learn what that really means. There's so much more to our faith than, you know, than just getting prophecies and prayer and all these sort of things, which are all good. We get to participate in the divine nature. That is stunning. Just absolutely stunning. What it doesn't say is that we become divine. Some people make a mistake on this verse. They go, oh, that means we're divine. No. We get to participate in the divine nature. We have Jesus on the inside. We've asked Jesus into our heart. We've been filled with the Holy Spirit. The divine nature has participated with us. The divine nature has come into us. And we have the righteousness of Christ because of his divine nature. Have we become divine? No. We have become the sons and daughters of the king. We are not divine. He is divine. But we participate in the divine nature. Our nature has become touched by the divine. We are filled by the divine. We, I mean, that in itself is mind-blowing. You know, I don't know about you, but Jeff Cooper, filled with the divine. Who would have thought? 
You wouldn't have thought it if you were with me yesterday when I got abused by a person as I was riding my bike. The divine did not come out, (laughs) unfortunately. I was very upset because they were being very nasty to me. But that's all good. I'm still here. But we've got the divine on the inside. That is just so precious. And his promises allow us to participate in the divine nature. Look at this, Romans 12, 9 to 10. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a promise. This is the precious promise that the Bible talks about. For if, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. This is such a precious promise because it tells us that if we do that, we are saved. There will be days when, when the enemy comes against you. There will be days when you're going through seasons when you need to remember that you have confessed Jesus Christ with your mouth and, and asked him into your heart and that you are saved. The deceiver comes sometimes and goes, oh, you, you know, are you really saved? Anybody had that? Yep. Well, I'm, I'm the only one. No, no, there's a few others. Good. Yeah, no, no, the, the promise of God tells me. The word of God tells me. John chapter 6, verses 39 and 40. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those you've given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. That's a promise. The Father's will is that everyone who looks to Jesus and believes in him shall have eternal life. It's a promise that we can stand on. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. A lot of scripture this morning, but these are promises and these are things that are, that are good for us. And I think Joel will be... be, be no, Nathan, he's not here. Sorry. He's, he's isolating. He would be happy. And there's lots of word. And hopefully context. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, 1 to 9. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. When you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even When we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages we might show the incorruptible riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And it is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Isn't that so amazing? It's the gift of God that we've been saved. And we are seated with him in the heavenly realms. This is where it's talking about his promises being greater because he has taken us, all of us here this morning, and he has put us in the heavenly realm, seated alongside Jesus Christ. Now, not one of us would think that we should have that favor. There isn't one of us that would walk into heaven and say, I think I should sit next to Jesus. I'd be finding the, I'd be finding the, the seat at the back. I'd be, I'd be finding the seat as low as I could go. Not because I'm trying to be humble, but Jesus, I can't be on the same level. I mean, and yet there's a mystery that says Jesus allows us to be seated with him. Isn't that beautiful? It's so powerful. And sometimes I think we forget the promises that have been given to us. We are seated with him in the heavenly realms. Just some beautiful promises from the Word of God this morning. And if you write those down or if you're taking notes, if you meditate on them, if you think about them, and there are so many more, it'll actually help us have things to anchor to. And it'll help you help others have things to anchor to. Because it's important for us to, to know the Word of God, and that is an anchor point which I think will be being preached about next week. I'm not sure. It's not me preaching. But the Word of God is an anchor point. Because it gives us all these great promises. It gives us the things that we can anchor ourselves to when we're going through t- you know, different times. They're great promises in great times. 
Now, let's not just dwell on, you know, challenging seasons. A lot of the times we have wonderful seasons, and it's thanks to the promises of God that we have them. We've only read a few this morning, but, you know, it, we, we, are, we are saved, you know. I mean, please don't take this the wrong way, but there are people in a whole lot worse situations than us this morning. Way worse. But God has given us promises, and he's given us promises for them as well. We can be praying the promises of God for the people of Ukraine. We can be praying the promises of God for the churches of Ukraine. We can be praying the promises of God for people all around the world. Now, let's face it, they're not the, that's not the only thing that's going on in the world today that's difficult. It's just one of the things that's on television, and it's horrendous, and it's horrible. And if you'd like to be part of Blessing Ukraine, we do have a basket at the back of the auditorium now. Uh, all those funds go to Ukraine. They go through the C3 Church Network in Ukraine, which is still still operating. Uh, and even if it's not, it will be operating in the countries around because we have C3 churches in those countries and they will be getting funds straight to where it needs to go. So if you'd like to be a part of that, we, we would encourage you to do it. The basket's going to stay there until it needs to not be there. And th it is also for flood relief for our Australian churches as well, which you're welcome to put in. Just mark which one that you're actually wanting to give to. I'm going to bring this in for a landing right now. But Peter goes on in 2 Peter and, and talks about what we need to be doing because we've been given these wonderful, precious promises. We started out in, first, in, in, in 2 Peter, we read verses 1 to 3, where it starts talking about his divine power has, been, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who have called us by his glory and his goodness. It's his glory and his goodness that's called us. It then goes on, though, in verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge. It's amazing how, how many times knowledge comes up. He's trying to tell us something, church, that, that he wants us to have the knowledge of him. He wants us to know about him. We need to know about our Savior. We need to know the promises. We need to know them because they are things we can stand on. They are rock solid. And if we don't know them, we'll actually be shaken and we'll actually be, you know, sort of bent around the place because we, we, we're not on that solid foundation. We have to have the knowledge of him. And then to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection. And to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge, there it is again, of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a key to helping us be productive in our knowledge of Jesus Christ is to add these things to our lives, to add goodness, to add knowledge, to add self-control, to add perseverance, to add godliness, Mutual affection, love. For if we possess these things in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. It's a really important list that we start adding these things to our faith that we keep working on them. It says, it's, Peter is saying here, he's saying, because you've been given these great and precious promises, because you've actually been you know, allowed to partner with the divine, you need to add these things to your faith. And you need to keep them happening in increasing measure, which means we just keep adding. We keep going, we keep going, we keep going. Uh, it, this list, I don't think, is finite in the sense that you're going to get to a point where you've got enough goodness. Or you're going to get to a point where you've got enough mutual respect. Or you're going to get to a point where you've got enough love. Or you've got enough knowledge. It's just something we continue to grow in day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. As we walk and live with Jesus Christ. These things need to be added so that we are not ineffective or unproductive. I mean, all of us want to be effective and productive in our faith. All of us want to see great fruit happening in our lives and the lives of the church family and the lives of people around us. And these are some keys and some promises from, from God that will really help us. They are anchor points. If we will take these home and meditate on them, and you know, 
I, I, I don't know what you should do with this. Maybe pick one. Maybe pick perseverance. Probably a good one right now. And start to grow in it. Start to learn about it. Talk to the Lord about perseverance. What, where, where do I need to persevere, Father? In what way do I need to persevere? How can I bring perseverance more into my world? Self-control. Now, there's a good one. I lost it for 30 seconds yesterday. I found it again. But it's something we can keep working on. Self-control. You know, we can keep working on love. So that these things keep, keep growing, keep increasing. If I can have the, um, the trinity of testosterone to come back, please. <laughs> well, I just thought of it. You know, this morning I looked there and there were the three men. And I thought, well, we probably haven't had three men by themselves for quite a while. It's normally we've got a lot of female worship leaders. And I thought the trinity of testosterone. There we go. Oh, I nearly meant to... I, 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 Earlier on, I, I nearly meant to sort of fiddle with this because I thought, this is great. I, I, get to, I, get to, I could really muck around with Jono's head right now and press Big Sky or Dig or Golden Horse. Wow, okay. They've all got names. It's, it's amazing. Illuminate. Lovely. And I am preaching, and hi to everybody watching. We're glad you're doing it. <laughs> we believe in having fun at C3 Wynyard. Because we have... The promises, the promise of participating in the divine nature, we should make every effort to grow in our faith. Because we have the knowledge of Jesus and his promises, they're anchor points for the mature faith. And it's so important that we actually keep anchoring ourselves to them. So, Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your promises. We thank you that they are anchor points for each one of us. And I pray that we would take this seriously. Father, I pray that you would give us fresh revelation on areas that we could grow in so that we would not be unknowledgeable in the things of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we would actually be productive and effective. Father, we just thank you for this in your precious and your mighty name. Amen? Amen. Hey, why don't we stand up, church? We've got a few moments just to finish in worship.